This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. The Island of Dr. Moreau by H. G. Wells. Chapter 15 Concerning the Beast Folk. I woke early. Moreau's explanation stood before my mind, clear and definite, from the moment of my awakening. I got out of the hammock and went to the door to assure myself that the key was turned. Then I tried the window bar and found it firmly fixed. That these men-like creatures were in truth only bestial monsters, mere grotesque travesties of men, filled me with a vague uncertainty of their possibilities which was far worse than any definite fear. A tapping came at the door, and I heard the glutinous aspects of Mling speaking. I pocketed one of the revolvers, keeping one hand upon it, and opened to him. "'Good morning, sir,' he said, bringing in, in addition to the customary herb breakfast, an ill-cooked rabbit. Montgomery followed him. His roving eye caught the position of my arm, and he smiled askew. The puma was resting to heel that day, but Morrow, who was singularly solitary in his habits, did not join us. I talked with Montgomery to clear any ideas of the way in which the beast folk lived. In particular, I was urgent to know how these inhuman monsters were kept from falling upon Moreau and Montgomery and from rending one another. He explained to me that the comparative safety of Moreau and himself was due to the limited mental scope of these monsters. In spite of their increased intelligence and the tendency of their animal instincts to reawaken, they had certain fixed ideas implanted by Moreau in their minds which absolutely bounded their imaginations. They were really hypnotized had been told that certain things were impossible and that certain things were not to be done, and these prohibitions were woven into the texture of their minds beyond any possibility of disobedience or dispute. Certain matters, however, in which old instinct was at war with Morrow's convenience were in a less stable condition. A series of propositions called the Law, I had already heard them recited, battled in their minds with the deep-seated, ever-rebellious cravings of their animal natures. This Law they were ever repeating, I found, and ever breaking. Both Montgomery and Moreau displayed peculiar solitude to keep them ignorant of the taste of blood. They feared the inevitable suggestions of that flavour. Montgomery told me that the law, especially amongst the feline beast people, became oddly weakened about nightfall, that then the animal was at its strongest, that a spirit of adventure sprang up in them at the dusk, when they would dare things they never seemed to dream about by day. To that I owed my stalking by the leopard man on the night of my arrival. But during these earlier days of my stay they broke the law only furtively and after dark. In the daylight there was a general atmosphere of respect for its multifarious prohibitions. And here, perhaps, I may give a few general facts about the island and the beast people. The island, which was of irregular outline and lay low upon the wide sea, had a total area, I suppose, of seven or eight square miles. It was volcanic in origin, and was now fringed on three sides by coral reefs some fumaroles to the northward, and a hot spring, were the only vestiges of the forces that had long since originated it. Now and then a faint quiver of earthquake would be sensible, and sometimes the ascent of the spire of smoke would be rendered tumultuous by gusts of steam. But that was all. The population of the island, Montgomery informed me, now numbered rather more than sixty of these strange creations of Morrow's art, not counting the smaller monstrosities which lived in the undergrowth, and were without human form. Altogether he had made nearly a hundred and twenty, but many had died, and others, like the writhing footless thing of which he had told me, had come by violent ends. In answer to my question, Montgomery said they actually bore offspring, but that these generally died. When they lived, Morrow took them and stamped the human form upon them. There was no evidence of the inheritance of their acquired human characteristics. The females were less numerous than the males and liable to much furtive persecution, in spite of the monogamy the law enjoined. It would be impossible for me to describe these beast people in detail. My eye has had no training in details, and unhappily I cannot sketch. Most striking, perhaps, in their general appearance, was the disproportion between the legs of these creatures and the length of their bodies. And yet, so relative is our idea of grace, my eye became habituated to their forms, and at last I even fell in with their persuasion that my own long thighs were ungainly. Another point was the forward carriage of the head and the clumsy and inhuman curvature of the spine. 
even the ape-man lacked that inward sinuous curve of the back which makes the human figure so graceful. Most had their shoulders hunched clumsily, and their short forearms hung weakly at their sides. Few of them were conspicuously hairy, at least until the end of my time upon the island. The next most obvious deformity was in their faces, almost all of which were prognathous, malformed about the ears with large and protuberant noses, very furry or very bristly hair, and often strangely coloured or strangely placed eyes. None could laugh, though the ape-man had a chattering titter. Beyond these general characters, their heads had little in common. Each preserved the quality of its peculiar species. The human mark distorted but did not hide the leopard, the ox, or the sow, or other animal or animals from which the creature had been moulded. The voices, too, varied exceedingly. The hands were always malformed, and though some surprised me by their unexpected human appearance, almost all were deficient in the number of the digits, clumsy about the fingernails, and lacking any tactile sensibility. The two most formidable animal men were my leopard-man and a creature made of hyena and swine. Larger than these were the three bull-creatures who pulled in the boat. Then came the silvery hairy man, who was also the sayer of the law, Mling, and a satyr-like creature of ape and goat. There were three swine-men and a swine-woman, a mere rhinoceros creature, and several other females whose sources I did not ascertain. There were several wolf-creatures, a bear-bull, and a St. Bernard man. I have already described the ape-man, and there was a particularly hateful and evil-smelling old woman made of vixen and bear, whom I hated from the beginning. She was said to be a passionate votary of the law. Smaller creatures were certain dappled youths, and my little sloth-creature. But enough of this catalogue. At first I had a shivering horror of the brutes, felt all too keenly that they were still brutes. But insensibly I became a little habituated to the idea of them, and moreover I was affected by Montgomery's attitude towards them. He had been with them so long that he had come to regard them as almost normal human beings. His London days seemed a glorious, impossible past to him. Only once in a year or so did he go to Arica to deal with Morrow's agent, a trader in animals there. He hardly met the finest type of mankind in that seafaring village of Spanish mongrels. The men aboard ship, he told me, seemed at first just as strange to him as the beast-men seemed to me, unnaturally long in the leg, flat in the face, prominent in the forehead, suspicious, dangerous, and cold-hearted. In fact, he did not like men. His heart had warmed to me, he thought, because he had saved my life. I fancied even then that he had a sneaking kindness for some of those metamorphosed brutes, a vicious sympathy with some of their ways, but that he attempted to veil it from me at first. Milling, the black-faced man, Montgomery's attendant, the first of the beast-folk I had encountered, did not live with the others across the island, but in a small kennel at the back of the enclosure. The creature was scarcely so intelligent as the ape-man, but far more docile, and the most human-looking of all the beast-folk and Montgomery had trained it to prepare food, and indeed to discharge all the trivial domestic offices that were required. It was a complex trophy of Morrow's horrible skill, a bear tainted with dog and ox, and one of the most elaborately made of all of his creatures. It treated Montgomery with a strange tenderness and devotion. Sometimes he would notice it, pat it, call it half-mocking, half-jocular names, and so make it caper with extraordinary delight. Sometimes he would ill-treat it, especially after he had been at the whisky, kicking it, beating it, pelting it with stones or lighted fuses. But whether he treated it well or ill, it loved nothing so much as to be near him. I say I became habituated to the beast people, that a thousand things which had seemed unnatural and repulsive speedily became natural and ordinary to me. I suppose everything in existence takes its colour from the average hue of our surroundings. Montgomery and Moreau were too peculiar an individual to keep my general impressions of humanity well defined. I would see one of the clumsy bovine creatures who worked the launch treading heavily through the undergrowth, and found myself asking, trying hard to recall, how he differed from some real human yokel trudging home from his mechanical labours. Or I would meet the fox-bear woman's vulpine shifty face, strangely human in its speculative cunning, and even imagine I had met it before in some city byway. Yet every now and then the beast would flash out upon me beyond doubt or denial. An ugly-looking man, a hunchbacked human savage to all appearance, squatting in the aperture of one of the dens, 
would stretch his arms and yawn, showing with startling suddenness scissor-edged incisors and sabre-like canines, keen and brilliant as knives. Or in some narrow pathway, glancing with a transitory daring into the eyes of some lithe, white-swathed female figure, I would suddenly see, with a spasmodic revulsion, that she had slit-like pupils. Or glancing down, note the curving nail with which she held her shapeless wrap about her. It's a curious thing, by the by, for which I am quite unable to account, that these weird creatures, the females, I mean, had in the earlier days of my stay an instinctive sense of their own repulsive clumsiness, and displayed in consequence a far more human regard for the decency and decorum of extensive costume. End of chapter 15 Recorded in Nottingham on the 22nd of November 2006 by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk